Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Rosanna and I'm here with Michael Kramer of Mott Capital. Today is FOMC Wednesday. So accordingly, we'll be discussing the Fed's decision, their message, markets reaction, the macro, and what it may mean for the markets going forward. So Michael, is this what you expected? And what do you think of Powell's tone today? Uh, you know, he was... He was his usual elusive self. Um, I didn't really hear much in the messaging that was different than what they've said over the last couple of months. Um, I mean, he 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 could have been a little more clear, I guess. But I thought it was um, what I found sort of interesting was more towards the end when they started to ask him about. Um, you know, the easing of financial conditions and whatnot. And he talked about, you know, and about the curve and, you know, what the market is sort of thinking about in terms of uh, Fed fund futures and the disparity between, you know, what the Fed is saying and what the curve is saying. And I thought it was weird for him to kind of, he almost, I got the impression was like, well, the, the market thinks something different than we do. And if the market wants to think that, then that's fine. And maybe it's because at the end of the day, an extra 50 basis points, 25 basis points doesn't matter much at this point. I mean, he raised rates 450 basis points in a year and did it with relatively, you know, benign damage to the broader equity market. You can probably consider that like a successful bout on his side. But, um, he kind of also, if I were, you know, my immediate reaction sitting with there was, well, you can think what you want and we're going to think what we want and we're going to find out who's right. <laughs> so it's almost like if you want to go against us, go ahead. But, you know, that's you're on your own. Agree. Um, to me, uh, the message has been the same. I mean, I, I wonder if anyone counted the amount of times he said the word inflation. He came right out and he said inflation um, is um, persistent elevated inflation is number one goal to bring down. I mean, that's right there. It's hawkish. Right. And to me, it sounded the same as the same message. You know, history reminds us of yeah. it warns us against premature easing and it still needs more restriction. Um, we're a couple more. He actually used the word a couple more hikes. Yeah. Uh, need more evidence to be confident. Long-term inflation is well anchored. He mentioned, um, you know, um, a lot of other same concerns uh, below trend growth. He said le last year, less than 1%. Then he mentioned the very tight labor market, lowest unemployment in 50 years. Yeah. To me, it was the same message. And then he mentioned core PCE going up 4.4%. And we know inflation is cumulative and we're seeing and i saw one of your tweets we're seeing cleveland fed saying it's going up again another month over month yeah so i mean persistent elevated inflation is still a, a big problem and doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon well i mean um when you uh i mean it, well i mean the more that the you know, you see weakening of the dollar and, and, and such, the more, you know, inflationary pressures you're going to have. And, and so, I mean, it would only make sense. And, you know, I think, you know, people may say like, well, you know, the Cleveland Fed obviously has, you know, been off the last couple of months, but I mean, I'm looking at it from the standpoint of, I don't care if Cleveland Fed is a 10th higher than what the street is at, or Cleveland Fed comes in yeah. a 10th lower than what the actual number is, because it's telling me that this month we're running at, we don't know what the adjustments will be, but this CPI this month could be running at a 0.6% month over month increase. And that's certainly, you know, everyone likes to take the three month and annualize it or the one month and annualize it or the six month and annualize it. But if you take that six tenths and then all of a sudden you start annualizing your three month trend, well, I mean, guess what? 
your three month trend isn't going to be going down anymore. And so, you know, I think, you know, people get very impatient. They don't know how to just kind of relax and, and take it easy and, and take time to digest what's happening in the markets. And it's always about, you know, being right or wrong on the instant. And, and so, you know, I, I, I think that the reaction from the bond market was sort of strange. And I, I don't have, I mean, we don't know how much of it is um, positioning, you know, going into the Fed. We don't know how much of it is uh, due to expectations of what the ECB is going to say tomorrow. But, you know, the two-year moving down nine basis points to me is interesting. And the 10-year moving down nine basis points is interesting because, again, the Fed sort of stuck to the idea of going to 5% to five and a quarter. They're not yet at sufficiently restrictive financial conditions. And so, you know, why did those things fall? Why did the dollar fall? I mean, typically when you see rates at the front and the back fall and the cold curve move down and the dollar weaken, it's usually indicative of, you know, what maybe people are pricing in as recessionary risks. Like, you know, hey, the Fed's going to run this economy off the cliff. That's one interpretation of what that may mean. Now, I, I'm not going to say that's definitive or not because I don't know what's tomorrow's price action will bring because, again, we always know that the knee-jerk reaction isn't always the correct correct reaction or the reaction that really is going to hold. And, you know, we got our typical sort of implied volatility event risk comes out of the market, market goes higher, nothing unusual there, nothing we haven't seen in the last six or seven Fed meetings. But we also need to remember that IV today is much lower. We're at a much lower starting point than where we were, you know, in July, for example, or in August or September. So there's just less room for more volatility compression. And when you factor in valuations and what's looking to be like a, a no growth 2023, you know, when those spreads are contracting, you really, you have to be cautious and wondering what all of this stuff means. And so, um, you know, uh, so I, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's just, I, I think that this, we're in a, a very precarious spot and I think that the risks are much higher than what many people um, perceive them to be. I agree with you. Uh, there's like a divergence going on and I, nothing has really changed much. I mean, we see disinflation, um, durable goods, you know, the used car, you know, and, and you know, mainly goods because of the supply chain issues clearing up. Um, but, you know, at some point that will end and we're going to have the services and I mean, still tight labor market. I mean, services are a function of the labor market and employment. So there's just a certain level. I remember you wrote a great article, I think a month ago or, or so, about you were saying maybe inflation would stay in the range of 4 to 6%. And I think that's very plausible, makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, there's a divergence going on. There's a risk on appetite with um, you know, the market. And I mean, we're, you know, we went, what are we, SPX went to 41.19, um, QQQ is over 300. Um, and it just seems like they're just completely ignoring Powell and, and his message. Maybe it just feels that we're nearing the end of the cycle. Um, but it, I agree but with even, you. I think we're. And that's mm -hmm. what the funny part is. It's like, even if like we are at the end of the cycle, which we're clearly, you know, approaching a point where we are going to get to our 5% target, five and a quarter percent target, maybe. And, you know, maybe the Fed is going to stop at that point. <laughs> But I mean, just think about what that means. We haven't had a five and a quarter percent overnight rate in like what, 20 years? I, I, the market, the market, if the market is under the perception that, you know, the Fed coming in and court, cutting rates by 50 basis points going into the end of the year, taking it back to four and a half percent is going to solve all of its problems. Like, that's just not reality. I mean, maybe in like a fantasy land, that's what works. But yeah, I mean, you know, an S&P 500 trading at 18 times or 18 and a half times mm -hmm. 
no growth. I mean, yes, the, exactly. What this is sort of demonstrating to me more so is that there's just too much liquidity still in the system. And it really almost demonstrates that the Fed still has a lot more work to do because if there if the if the appropriate levels of liquidity were in the market this is very reminiscent this is this is very reminiscent in some ways maybe you disagree i don't know it feels very reminiscent of 2018 almost right when you know pal got up there in october of 2018 it's like oh we're nowhere near neutral and the market had a, a, a literal meltdown right uh, because it was rejecting the Fed raising rates further. You know, go back to 2016, 2015. The market was melting down on the idea of the Fed raising rates from zero to 25 basis points, right? The market melted down in 2011 because, you know, uh, European growth was slowing and we obviously had the debt, debt downgrade. But I mean, this is not typical market function reaction, right? When the market typically disagrees with, with the Fed's view, the market doesn't typically rally, <laughs> which is agree, which is bizarre, right? I mean, very bizarre. Those are great comparisons. Absolutely, um, I, I do agree with you. You know, he used the words "the effects are still yet to be felt," and I think that goes right in line with what you just said. There's still too much liquidity out there. And there's more work to be done. So to me, this means actually, like you said, it's a precarious situation and there could be potentially a lot more pain to come um, yeah, when I, this I, these divergences merge and the reality becomes here yeah. um, and not fantasy world. And like, you know, I, I, I don't like, people will label me as a perma bear because they only know me over the last year and a half, right? Like I was, no one knew who I was really, you know, two years ago. And I unfortunately came onto the stage and was recognized at a time where I've been very bearish and very right because of my view. But I was one of, I was really out in front of this very far. But I mean, what people don't realize is that I was before this going into the, the 2020 pandemic, which really threw me for a loop, just like it did for many other people. I was mostly a bull. Right. I was one of the most bullish people around from 2016, 2017, even 2018, when the market was melting down. I was screaming that we weren't heading into a recession and that the market was going to rebound. Right. And that turned out to be the right call. And I'm just a data reality person. I, I, I'm not looking at this from the I'm a long only, you know, thematic growth investor looking for things that I can buy today and own for the next five to 10 years. And I look at the prospects of where we are right now and say, do I want to buy something right now for my portfolio with the prospects of owning it for the next five years? Or would I rather just wait another six months and see where valuations are or, you know, wait until certain stocks that I like come to me? And that's what I do at the heart of it. Right. And so when I look at the risk reward at this point. I don't see a path for us to go to new all-time highs when earnings are coming down, right? Liquidity is being withdrawn. Interest rates are at the least 350 basis points higher than where they were just a year ago. And so from a risk reward perspective, being a long-term investor with that type of mindset, the risk reward seems not in my favor to be going and adding positions to my portfolio at this point, right? And, you know, I try to take the day-to-day -day market gyrations and, and I try to work all of that into my longer term thinking and approach. And so the, where we sit right now today, I, I think that there's extra, if you're a long-term investor, I think there's a lot of a lot of risks in this market. If you want to try to day trade the market or swing trade the market or do whatever you do and you try to, you know, use data points and analysis to do that, that's like totally your call. But from a perspective of someone that's looking out and trying to assess the macro landscape, I think this is a very precarious situation because all it's going to take is one bad CPI report uh, to really 
upset the apple cart. And you've seen those those inflation swaps already 40, 50 basis points off that 2% low that was just seen a month ago in June. And, and so that to me is a big, a big shift. And you've seen it across exactly. the whole curve. It's that pattern change. And it's not that's not the half point. It's the pattern emerging that it's starting to rise. And that's significant, in my opinion. You know, you touched upon two big points that I want to go into. First of all, we have to talk about the equity risk premiums and the risk free rates are over four percent. Look, I'm doing T bill T bills four weeks. I'm getting what four and a quarter, four over four. Right. You know, with the risk free rate so high, and compared to where we were, you know, two three years ago, um, you know, you the the SPX earnings yield it has to rise so prices and valuations come down. Otherwise, SPX is way too expensive. And I remember you made that point the other day in a tweet as well. Yeah. I so know. we have SPX is like about 18 right now. If you take the top six out, I think you're still what 16, 17 um, PEs. I mean, that's still significantly high. Especially in a 3% growth rate world. Yes. I, I mean, so... the risk right because in in a, if if we are heading into a recession like so many people think we are i i don't i mean i remember very clearly i I've, I've been in more in the stagflationary camp where i don't think we're going to necessarily be yes me too mm -hmm. but we're just going to be sort of in this higher inflation low growth rate world and you know and and that's going to justify you know rates staying higher for longer and that's going to justify, you know, margin compression and that's going to just and that's what most of this earnings decline that we're seeing is revenue estimates have actually held up. Most of it, what we're seeing is margin compression. I mean, even AMD yesterday went up eight or nine percent today. Right. I have, you know, which I think was mostly due to event, event risk coming out of the stock and just people, you know, crushing IV in it. But you know, their gross margins were expected to be lower than expected next quarter. Typically, you know, when AMD does that, stock gets hammered. It doesn't rally, <laughs> right? And then, so, you know, you're seeing, you know, margin compression really across many names. And, 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 and so that's really what I think is going to lead to, you know, earnings coming down to, you know, the 215 to 220 region and, and maybe 210. But, you know, again, at 18, if they do go down to 210, you're not talking about an S&P at 4,100, right? You're talking at about an S&P even at a lower valuation still. So you got like these two forces that are really fundamentally going against the grain. Now, the only thing that changes that equation is the liquidity that's in the system. And the only thing that can continue to keep the market kind of elevated is liquidity. Um, and unless there's been some sort of meaningful breakdown between res the relationship between reserve balances and and, and equity market caps, um, the liquidity is being sucked out of the market right now. But somehow it holds together, uh, which has been the first time that that's something I've observed probably going back over a year now, and I've been following the balance sheet for many years. And so this behavior is a little bit odd. It did happen in 2018, and it could be because financial conditions have eased and that's allowed for more leverage uh, to be put into the system. Uh, but again, like the, the, the balance is, if you just try to look and be a realistic investor, I, I, I don't see how you know you can be an Uber bull at this point and not realize what the risk reward ratios are. Agree. You know, margins compression. I've been talking about this, I think, since we met. I mean, I've noticed this. I mean, you know, I'm in manufacturing here. Uh, we have an international manufacturing company. And I noticed our margins starting to get compressed at the end of 21. Um, and, you know, as we had increase in cost of goods sold, operating expenses, 
and they're new fees. It's not just existing fees. There's a lot of new sure. fees that are a part of the labor inflation. I have so many employment fees, the IAS surcharge here in New York, because um, we depleted our enhanced benefits. So we're paying the Fed because New York depleted it. And there's just so much of a COVID backlash. And I know it could be regional, but I think it's actually national. There's this entrenchment persists and my vendors are all over the country as well as I have some foreign investors and then vendors and it's uh, pretty you know nothing's come down in price and I'm actually just got a letter last week of some more pricing going up for one of my components so you know margins are getting compressed and you know people don't seem to understand inflation works both ways so if inflation's going to come down revenues are also going to come down significantly because it's they're being really helped up more so by inflation than higher volume and output. We have low growth, I mean, very low growth and high inflation. There's more debt, um, and you know the you know we have increased defi deficit spending and. Um, you know, there's just a lot of issues going on, but it goes that back to earnings. And when we look at these earnings, we see they're getting compressed. And then at the same time, we have higher cost of debt and capital. So you have businesses, riskier assets. And I see a lot of them running in the market. Maybe it's just a short covering. But, you know, these, these companies that require a constant refinance, and to to maintain to get their capital infusion they're refinancing at much higher rates and so um what does that mean six to 12 months down the road so that's my concern as i'm looking at it from you know a financial point of view you know i being a ceo of the company i was cfo for many years so i look at it from the financial part and i'm just i don't see how it's sustainable so I agree with you. Of course, I like to jump into this rally and I, I am doing some trading um, and I'm riding this wave, but you know, it's uh, high risk in my opinion um, right now. So um, what are you doing, Michael, in this market? Are you waiting? Are you just watching? Are you doing, I know you're a long-term only like um, in your portfolio. Are you doing anything these days? Um, I'm basically just sort of, trying to wait you know i i don't i'm looking for things i have lists of things i want to own at certain prices and i've you know i readjusted my portfolio a lot throughout 2022 and i bought you know a couple things along the way um sold a bunch of stuff that i didn't you know really have a desire to own anymore uh on rallies and um you know right now i'm just sort of waiting and seeing what's going to happen and trying to you know understand you know what's driving the market but ultimately no i'm not doing anything i'm more than happy to sit with money and money market accounts and earn a decent return for not doing anything and having to worry about it and um you know i'm just waiting i think there are better opportunities still to come I agree. That makes a lot of sense. Patience is rewarded. We know that from trading, you know, from investing. I know you were in it before 2000 and I began the late 90s. So we know how the pattern works and there are going to be lots of great opportunities coming. It's important to remain liquid, to seize those opportunities and cash is king. And I always look at free cash flow yields and, um, you know, companies with high debt are concerning. So Yes, I've also um, reduced my risk. So I'm using this time period to sell off any positions that I was not 100% on yeah. and reducing that risk. I think it's a great time to do that and to streamline the portfolio a little bit and tighten it up. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a smart I, I thing. I think, like, you know, if I had the view that we weren't going to go into a recession, which I, I, I have. And instead of the S and P 500 trading at 4,100, and we were trading at 36 or 3,700, um, and I had listened to Powell's press conference today, um, 
I probably would have been, you know, more constructive and said, you know, maybe I want to buy something down at these levels because, you know, he's okay with financial conditions tight loosening because he's going to let the data speak for itself, right? And, you know, market valuations are, you know, reasonable here, 15, 16 times earnings. I know my downside maybe is 33, 3,400. You know, I'm willing to buy something down here because, I know the risk is to the downside is limited compared to the, what the risk on maybe missing out on something to the upside. But, you know, it just, it gets tricky when, you know, you're looking at, you know, high valuations in, in a market that seems very manic at times. Yeah. And I noticed the equity risk premium spread seems pretty narrow. Last time we talked, I think you said it was, at like a near uh, term yeah. I low. I mean, it's at a 2007 level and it's at levels that were very consistent with the mid nineties. I mean, the mid two thousands when, you know, when rates were higher again. So maybe we've returned to some sort of equity risk premium that's more consistent on a historical basis, um, at least with the, with the nineties, I'm, I'm sorry, with the mid two thousands when we had higher rates, higher inflation rates. And maybe, maybe, maybe this is the appropriate level uh, for where the spread should be. But again, you know, it's such a short period of time that it's hard to know with any great certainty. Um, but again, like either, you know, rates on the 10 year need to fall dramatically from here. Uh, and, or, you know, the equity risk premium based off of where we were in over the last, since 2010 seems too tight. Um, what would cause the 10-year to collapse, though, uh, would obviously be a sign that we are indeed heading to some sort of, you know, recessionary growth scare. Um, and that's not a positive. Yeah, there's no way to see a real positive, it seems. Yeah. Um, you either get one or the other. And I also tend to believe that stagflation is probably more, more likely, and I hate to sound like a bear. I mean, you know, people say I'm very bearish sounding, but the macro itself is very bearish right now, and there's no other way well, around it. So, you know, you have low growth and high inflation. I mean, you're setting up a stage for, for stagflation. Right. Well, the, other, the other problem um, is, too, is that you have China reopening, and they're going to start sucking commodities out of everywhere, and that means prices are probably going to rise again. And and so I think there's like a, a fine balancing act. And that's why I'm like laser focused on commodity prices right now and inflation swaps. And because I want to see, you know, what they're saying. And, yeah. and, you know, if and you're not really seeing services inflation come down much. So it's hard to, if the world was all balanced and everyone was opening at the same time. And again, I, I think for me, it's all about, you know, where valuations are and, and, and right now I just don't see a good risk reward relationship. Yes, of course. I think China reopening, um, many are saying it's going to add to the inflation. And I, I do think that's very likely and commodities prices have just shot through the roof. I mean, you know, the, the copper was up significantly. Gold is rallying again today, especially after Fed, you know, the Fed decision, we saw gold rally, but they've been on a, it's been on a tear lately, completely coffee, you know, we have sugar rallying, yeah. um, you know, all that it's setting up a stage for stagflation. Uh, are you long any of the commodities? Um, Hopefully a little bit. I'm not. And the reason why I'm not is because in 2010, I was really into the whole weaker dollar quantitative easing trade. And I spent a lot of time, my daughter is going to be coming in the car. Uh, I'm on the phone. And I was, <laughs> I, was, um, I was into that trade for a really long time. And what happened was, is I realized how cyclical and the nature of the business is. And because you really can't hold on to anything there. Time. Yes, I recall that time. Um, I ended up jumping in. I've been trading commodities on futures with the metals um, lately. But, you know, um, 
it's it's a very volatile thing. So when valuations are key, and the market right now is seeming to me as well to be very pricey, and if their equity risk premium does go back to the mid 2000s time period, like you said, and we we had this discussion I think last time that maybe there's a that the spread is changing. And now it's going to be more narrow than it has been with these higher rates. A SPY, the SPX still seems a little expensive with the PE at about 18 where it's at. And knowing that earnings are going to continue their compression with this higher cost of debt and higher um, expenses as well. So um, I think that it's, there's, a, there's like a, a lag maybe six to nine months. Yeah, if, um, if you look, and, I, and a lot of people are talking about the second half of the year being critical here. Yeah, but if you look at you know the 2000s, P multiples were in the 13, 14, 15 range. They weren't 18. You know, we had a 2% spread on, on an equity risk premium uh, with a 10 year in the, in the threes, but, or the fours or whatever the numbers were at that point, but you only had you didn't have PEs at, at these levels. You had them still lower. So uh, it, it, and it's just, you know, again, I, I just continue to think that, you know, markets are, are unfortunately today, there's a lot of liquidity in the system. They're very heavily influenced by zero days till expiration option trading um, and gamma squeezes and, you know, volatility selling and, you know, there's just so much of a casino component to it today. It makes sort of like the daily, the understanding of what's driving trading every single day, very complex and very difficult. And it's almost like you need to have like a PhD in options trading to understand half of what's going on on a daily basis. Agree. That would make for a good course. <laughs> I think that'd probably be a lot of people signing up for that one. Um, with all the zero DTE trading going on, there's a lot of uh, the day trading um, going on with the options. And yeah, I think that day trading this market with the volatility we've had, can, if you can catch it the right way, um, there's money to be made. Um, that's not something I do. I know that's not what you do. Right. Um, and, you know, someone wrote in the notes here that Powell had said it's disinflationary. And I just want to correct that. It, um, Powell did say there, there's disinflation. But what Michael and I are speaking about uh, is overall inflation is cumulative. And when you look at the Cleveland Fed and you see the pattern that we've had, we have a consistent increase in core and headline, broad-based, up every month. So to me, there's a deceleration, um, but they're still increasing. And I'm a great economist that I actually uh, had on my podcast, uh, global economist Daniel Lacaye said, it's like he, he compared inflation to gaining weight. And he said that if you gain 10 pounds one year, and then you gain five pounds the next year, you're still gaining weight. Right. And he compared that to inflation. And I like that. Um, it's a very way, it's a great way to simplify inflation for everyone is that you're still having inflation. Right. It just means that your inflation is just increasing at a slower rate. But yes, it's, you know, so you go from 8% inflation to 6% inflation. Well, it's better than going up at 8%, but you're still going up at 6% and you're going up 6% on top of the 8% you had last year. So it's almost like when you buy a stock and you know it goes up 20% and then it goes up another 20% or it goes up 10%, you're still up you know, 30 or 40% on it. It's, it's a, the cumulative effect exactly. is that you know, prices aren't, disinflation is, doesn't mean that prices are falling. It means that they're just rising exactly. at a slower pace. And, exactly. and so we, I mean, it's obvious to me that we are in a period of disinflation, <laughs> but the problem is, is that 
you know, how higher rates going to ultimately have to go until you get to a point where the Fed is satisfied that we're on a path to go back to a, a 2% or around that 2% average. And a 0.6% month over month CPI would certainly raise question to whether or not we are on that path. Because all of a sudden, that's a 7% annualized rate, right? And that's higher than what we currently are at. So I just think that that we, you know, again, if you have the ability to, to uh, I'm in the mindset of, of trying to be just a patient investor and, and trying to, um, you know, use daily movements to figure out where prices are going over, over the longer term. And, um, you know, again, I don't think today's price action was unusual. I think we've seen it time and time and time again over the course of the last year and a half, you know, and so I don't really believe today's rally one bit. You're not convinced. I love it. Um, yeah, tomorrow could be a whole different thing. You know, we'll see. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna be making any predictions because we don't do that, but right. anything is possible tomorrow. Um, to me, he was a hawk. Um, nothing's really changed much. And you know what? What what is changing is the calibration of CPI. And I guess I made a joke about this: how oh, if we don't like the CPI number, well, let's find a new way to calibrate it. Right. So next month, um, we're, or this month actually, I think we're going to be having a new calibration. I am not. I, I know it's. I think it's going to be over. They're going to be doing it year with one year instead of two. I think that's the new way of doing it. Are right. you familiar with the way the new calibration is going to be? And you think, how do you think it's going to affect? You think it's going to make it look better? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Supposedly they're supposed to do it off of the 20, the trends in 2021 people were doing then. Um, supposedly this new numbers are coming out uh, a couple of days before the CPI release. I think they're coming out on the 10th. And that's when the new weights will be posted. And um, if we think about, you know, what people were doing in 2021, I, I don't know. I guess they were still at home buying a lot of stuff over at, online. So does that mean there's more waiting to goods and less waiting to services? I, I don't know. But I mean, I went back and I looked at the 2018 weightings and, verse, and compared them versus today. I mean, you're talking about very minor and minute changes. And so, I mean maybe it takes a 10th here or two tenths there, but I, I don't really think this is going to be like, you're going to wake up and inflation is going to be 3%, you know, on a, on a reweighting. I think it's, we're, we're talking about very, very minor changes. Like gasoline went from, you know, maybe four and a half to 3.9 over that four year period or something like along those lines. So it probably won't be as much. Um, I don't. I, I don't think, think that's for the gonna, best. I don't think it's going to be like you know, you can't beat inflation, so change the numbers, and all of a sudden, boom, you, your inflation problem is solved. No, I don't think that's. Gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe that's what people are thinking. Maybe that's why the market is rallying as it is. Maybe they think that something magical will happen at some point. Um, you know, uh, honestly, we look back I've to two thousand. I've seen <laughs> and I, I've been doing this long enough that that is not as far-fetched as it sounds. I know, right? It's that the market can be irrational. Now, we know from history, looking back to 2000, um, you and I were investing back then, um, you know, bear market rallies. And I, I don't want to label anything what this is or not, but, you know, bear market rallies get more irrational as the bear goes on. And it has a lot to do with the human uh, emotions and you know, we could be in something like that. And then, you know, someone mentioned maybe going into two bears, like back to back, or um, this just being another bear market rally. So I guess you could believe that very possible. I mean, sure, we haven't even gotten past the August highs yet. So I, 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 it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to think of it as being anything else, right? I, I, I mean, if you had told me, you know, in, in September when, you know, or October, 
that the dollar was going to fall 12%. The two year was going to go from 460 to 410. Uh, the three year was going to go from four and a quarter to three and a half. I would be like, oh, the S&P 500 should be like 45, 4,600. To me, it's made, it's made, <laughs> I mean, to me, this is just like, okay, you know, it's really, it's kind of, a, it almost feels like a little bit of like a pathetic rally, to be quite honest, because there has been added liquidity, clearly, uh, from whether it be uh, through some of the reserve balance movements over the last couple of weeks, liquidity had been added, it's been being taken away again. Uh, you've obviously had, you know, favorable backdrops due to the coming down of uh, rates and the dollar. And all we are right now is we're still below the August highs. So, I mean, I, I don't really understand, I guess, to some degree what everyone is excited about. We're pretty much in the same exact spot as where we were on December 14th or December 13th. What Nothing has really changed. I mean, so I, I don't I don't get the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, I guess as the bear goes on, the human uh, emotion and irration people are just irrational. And I guess any sign of appreciation is excitement because um, it's been a tough time. It's been a tough year um, sure, for I think for almost everyone. It yeah. is, but I mean, you know, it, honestly, it. These are the types of opportunities, though, that create opportunities for long-term growth. I mean, if the market never went down, <laughs> you know, when would you, when would you ever really get the opportunity sometimes to buy a great company? You would always feel like, oh, it's too high. So, you know, this is what kind of helps, you know, create those opportunities too. And, and, and if you don't get pullbacks, you never get valuation resets. You never get the big opportunity sometimes to get into like really big names because otherwise, you know, that this is what these are for, you know, and it's, it's about exactly. being. Being patient. Be able to seize on them. And, and so exactly. you know, there's nothing wrong with the market going down. I mean, it's a, it's a normal it's a normal process. It's all about how you position for it and how you risk manage it. And, and so I look at these opportunities as, as great opportunities because I'm going to maybe be able to get to buy something that I wasn't able to buy a year ago. You know, I same. would never, I feel thought, the same way. Yeah. You know, I never would have bought, you know, like a stock I bought with Shopify Reese. You know, I bought that in June. It felt really horrible buying it at the time, but I I also knew that the valuation made sense. It had come down dramatically. I really like the business model. I like what they do, but you know I couldn't bring myself to buying Shopify at three hundred dollars or share or whatever it was, uh, twelve hundred dollars a share split adjusted, because the valuation was obscene, and you know I knew it was a, it was a bloated valuation that was from the land of make believe. But, you know, now it's like, this is a great opportunity for me. It's like buying Amazon in 2002. That's what I think, at least, you know, whether it is or not yet to be seen. <laughs> I think it's a great company. I'm also long Shopify. Um, unfortunately, never enough, you know, that's what always happens when you get one that runs so well. Um, and it's a great company. I think that I welcome downturns in the market. And I guess in some way I'm a little disappointed because I, I did have a significant amount of cash and I, I'd like to get good value and good buys. And the opportunity, every challenge brings forward opportunities. And I believe that, you know, we always just need to remain liquid to seize those opportunities and patience is rewarded. And there's no reason to jump in and then, you know, feel, a lot of people are feeling that fear of missing out right now because you see the market running and, you know, there's a lot of talk of people saying the market's just going to run away. Now it's, it's reversed and it's, it's done. And, and uh, you know, it's about being patient. And we've seen this happen before and, you know, it can be irrational. And to me, it's still, there are quite a few that are still pricey. And I have my buying list, my shopping list, I guess you call it. 
of stocks that I'm looking at. And right. I guess we could wrap up with that. Um, unless there's anything else you like to, to, to that I skipped or um, didn't mention, but you know, just to give people some ideas on what I'm targeting and you're targeting, we don't have to say names, but I'll just briefly go over some things I'm looking for. Um, I'm also like you, looking at growth companies, and because long term, they're the innovators and they're the ones that are gonna you know, disrupt industries. And actually my manufacturing business is a disruptor as well. And so it's very innovative with the way we, we do thermal engineering on our equipment. So you know, it's very important to me to, just like in 2000, you know, people buying Amazon, that was the future. That was a new way of shopping. And um, at the time they were a bookstore and then they became an everything store. So I'm looking at AI, and autonomous equipment, autonomous um, things, innovation. And when I look at companies, I look at ones that are streamlining their operations. Which ones are going to weather this storm that we have of compressed margins, higher costs of debt and capital? So I'm looking at companies that are increasing or at least maintaining their margins so they have that liquidity they need to grow and to expand. When you go and you vertically and horizontally integrate, you need that cash and you need to find ways to gain that market share and go into new industries. And that's what we did with our company back in 2008. So I use that as an example of what I'm looking for in companies. And, you know, uh, I have quite a list. Um, what are you, and I love it. intuitive surgical. I'm also long. Are you, are you long that one? Yeah, I've owned it since June. I'll own it for a very long time. I'm sure. I love unless it. You know, unless something materially changes. Exactly. Um, there's PRCT is another one in that space, robotic arm, you know, robotics and stuff in the medical field. So they're another one that I've been watching. Um, but I do like all of that robotic arm. It's all in some way autonomous, you know. It's using something else to do the surgeries and to do these medical procedures. So um, those are definitely innovative fields. Um, what are you looking at? Um, any ideas and anything you focus on just to give people um, ideas? So I've been looking at, uh, I, I really would like to buy like in the, an SPGI, S&P Global, or MSCI. Um, it's kind of boring sounding, but what I like about what I like about companies specifically are companies that have sort of a subscription model or subscription to some degree that just compounds growth over years. And you know, so S&P and Global and MSCI are two companies because they're basically you know. At the end of the day, I, I think about them as data providers, and um, when that you know you want the data, you're going to pay for it. <laughs> and uh, I think data obviously is very valuable, and and so I'm I'm looking at those two, um, trying to just be patient. I and and trying to figure out you know exactly where you know I want to pick them up. Although I have a rough idea. Um, then I'm looking at things like um, service now, for example, high revenue growth, you know, good margins, um, but again, not probably at lower prices still. Um, and things in that nature. I, I, I really want to focus on things that can grow, you know, revenues above trend, have strong operating margins, uh, and can deliver consistent growth. I, I just like things that can really sort of compound over time. And obviously the steadier the, the business growth is, the stickier the, the revenue stream is, um, the higher multiple they're usually awarded over time. And um, that's sort of what I'm, I'm really focused on at this point. Just kind of, you know, boring companies that just don't get a lot of attention, but, you know, can consistently, you know, grow their business and have something that people want. Um, and so I've also been looking like at Palo Alto networks and things of that nature as well. But again, like sometimes some of these valuations are getting closer to where I want to be. And, you know, if there were came a time where, um, the market sort of made sense again, from a, a risk reward standpoint, 
certainly, you know, those are things that I would want to add. Love it. Um, I agree with you. I like the subscription model as well. Um, I guess no Peloton for us, right? And that's known as a subscription model. No. Um, yeah, no, no. way. <laughs> but, um, you know, I like boring companies as well. I like to have a diversified portfolio. And, you know, Palo Alto, I'm long. I'm actually long a basket of cybersecurity. I am very bullish on cybersecurity for the long term. Um, I think that it's a backbone of the, you know, of internet and it's rising. I know that with our businesses as well, we have a lot of remote workers. And since COVID, there's been a huge, everyone knows this, but a huge increase in remote work. And that means cybersecurity measures are needed. So more than ever. And so Fortinet, Palo Alto, Zscaler, um, those are all, in my opinion, CrowdStrike, uh, those are all great companies. And I'm long a basket of those socks, some more than others. And I'm looking to add more if we do get that downturn. So Palo Alto is the best in the space, in my opinion. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And then medical and biotechs, um, healthcare, those, those type of uh, sectors as well, I think are great. Now, what do you think about the value versus growth? Um, I know that was on, a. we saw value appreciate. Now we've had a lot of growth this past month. Are you looking at any value companies? I know we were talking about Archer Daniels and yeah. any of those. Are you looking to add some of those boring I, ones? You know, honestly, I think the whole, <laughs> the whole growth to value thing to some degree is a little bit of a joke. Um, because if you've ever compared the list between the companies that are held in the SPYG versus the SPYV, there's a lot of overlap, <laughs> meaning they're both in the growth and in the value ETF, right? And so it's like, how can they be both, right? So I kind of take it with like a grain of salt. And I try to just say, you know, my view, my feeling has always been that if a stock is a value stock, it's a value stock for a reason because nobody wants to own it. And so I, I don't, I don't touch value stocks, right? Because the last thing I want to, I learned that lesson very early in life. I remember I bought Sycamore Networks when I was like 23 years old. Uh, and I was like, this is a great company. It was a $200 stock back in the tech days. And they got a billion dollars on the balance sheet. And the, the company is worth more in cash than what the market cap of the company was worth. And then like, I realized finally at some point, the reason why it was trading the way it was trading was because these guys don't make any money. And because the mark, the, the cash on hand kept falling. So I was like, holy crap, no wonder why it's a value stock because they just have depleting cash flow. They had, they were just losing money and the cash and the mark and the, and the, and the value of the cash holdings just kept declining. So <laughs> after learning That's that so lesson funny. the hard way. <laughs> I remember I, that I, stock. I can laugh about it now, but I mean, yeah. yeah, you look back on it 20 years ago, you feel like such an idiot. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> well, like, you oh learn well. What was, what was I thinking about? I know. So that, well, I learned that learned. lesson really the hard way. I'm like, you know, let me just stick to things that can actually grow and put up positive revenue and, and, and not fall into this, well, it's cheap versus it peers type of thing, because at some point the market's going to realize that what a value it is. I, I just, I just stay away from that. I can't, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. You know, you learn from experiences in life. So <laughs> I have to say, at least you learn from it. You know, some people just have it reoccurring mistakes. Um, but you know, I love that point you make about looking under the hood and it's so important to, instead of looking at headlines or just to look at tickers and these ETFs to see what's in the ETFs. And that's very important. And sometimes what I do is I go in there and I look at what's in the portfolio and I just, and I see they're heavily weighted with certain stocks. And I'm like, you know what? I'll just buy that stock instead of buying the whole basket of the ETF. You know, it's so um, funny today. I looked mm -hmm. at that AIEQ ETF, which is that -E artificial intelligence ETF. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, but have you ever looked at what the holdings were in it? Nope. 
Let's let, let's take a look now. It's like it's oh. like Novavax. It's like all these companies, and I'm like, what does this have to do with artificial intelligence? And then I really <laughs> started to read the description, and I think the description reads more like the art. It's like they're using artificial intelligence to pick the stocks. <laughs> oh it's, my gosh! It's not that. It's it, go read go read the description. <laughs> I uh, think I'm looking I'm at the stocks here. in there. I'm not a hundred percent, but if you actually look at the basket, the stocks, because I was like, you know, let me get some ideas. What are some stocks that I can buy yeah. that are similar to mm -hmm. chat GTP and, yeah. you know, outside of owning Microsoft. So I'm like, let me look and see what these things are being held here to get some ideas. And I'm looking, I'm like, what does Novavax have to do with AI? Are they using like artificial How intelligence? How about Starbucks? What does Starbucks have to do with AI? Are they using <laughs> AI to like, you know, get more throughput through the line or something? Right. <laughs> read the description of the actual ETF. I think it reads as if they're using artificial intelligence to pick the stocks that go in the basket. I could be completely wrong, but that's my, that was my quick, you know, 30,000 foot interpretation. I'm like, okay, this isn't, because then I just immediately turned it off because I'm like, this isn't any going anywhere where, where I want it to go. Yeah, they're using, it's focused on applying artificial intelligence based solutions to investment analysis. I don't know what that even means. <laughs> <laughs> I think it means, like you said, I think it means that they're using AI for investment analysis. Yeah. Right. So when I would, yeah, when I would think but of look how much oh, it's ETF is up. Yeah. Well, you know what? People probably don't know what's going on, but if you, oh, the name of the ETF is AI powered equity. So it's probably, yeah, the name itself would be really to stop and think about it. It's AI powered e e equity. So they're using AI to, to get the portfolio the in the, yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow, how <laughs> deceiving is that? That's so deceptive. Not, I don't think it's deceiving, but because it is, the name is the name. Like, I don't think they, I, I mean, again, like the name doesn't, isn't really telling you that this is, you know, we're picking AI names. I think that's just, the assumption maybe people make because yeah. maybe they're not looking at the membership. <laughs> yeah, but if you if you skim over it quickly and you're like, oh, I want to see AI, then you'll definitely miss that very important part of what type of ETF this really is. So well, right. maybe they're and not the intentionally. Yeah. So I because I I went there to get ideas. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I do too. I go to ETFs to get ideas as well. Um, but yeah, you know, but they were very smart. It's very catchy to have AI be the first part of the ETF name. So yes. um, I'm sure they're, yeah, that's a buzzword these days. So especially with, um, I wonder when they were started. Let's see. Oh, fun except inception 2017. So it's been around a long time, but I, wow. I anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. I know, that's funny. Maybe we should just end on um, that note. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it's been great, Michael. Always love speaking with you um, regarding everything. And thank you so much for taking valuable time in your day to speak with us all. Um, and uh, anything else you want to say? No, I, we should do these more often, though. So absolutely. I agree. And we can. Um, yeah, I, lo I love it. I have so much fun speaking with you. Yeah. So thank you so much to everyone for listening. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And we will, yeah, and we will see you soon. Michael and Rosanna coming soon to a spaces near you. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you for listening to the Rose Show podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon.